thank you very much, Liz, and, and thank you everyone, and welcome uh, to this this uh, day's public webinar on introducing or really reintroducing to some folks the U.S. Arctic Observing Network. Um, uh, next slide, please, Liz. We are going to do a number of things today. Um, I'm going to provide an introduction um, and brief overview, uh, but really devote much of the time to hearing from, from different partners, both from, from the federal government and from non-federal sectors, to discuss ways in which Arctic Observing Network activities um, really has broad reach and impact. Um, I'll begin by saying that the Arctic Observing Network concept as a whole has been around for some time now. Uh, I think most people would point to perhaps um, the, the fourth international polar year, which is about 14, 15 years hence. Um, around that time, there was a National Academy study uh, published um, titled Towards an Integrated Arctic Observing Network. And there have been subsequent activities and reference documents published uh, presenting a vision for international interdisciplinary approaches uh, to overcome some system challenges to Ar Arctic observing um, and by, by happenstance also uh, data systems. Uh, Arctic Observing Network, or AON, uh, presents both scientific and technological challenges, as well as policy planning and resource allocation challenges, um, so it requires action across many levels. Um, maybe the next slide would be helpful just to, to give a framework list. Thank you. So um, this slide shows you um, sort of a, 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 a horizon. You see an interface, um, sort of uh, terrestrial or sea ice, uh, looking uh, upward to atmospheric uh, areas. And so um, our schematic here represents uh, an interface between policy resource and planning issues um, with science and technology issues where the US Aon board is centered uh, between those two. Um, specifically, um, US agencies and inter part international partners have responded to uh, the, the US Aon vision in a variety of different ways. Uh, if you look at, for example, specific federal agencies like National Science Foundation, where I sit, um, the Arctic Observing Network funding program was established um, shortly after the IPY or around that same time. There was a special issue of the Arctic Research Journal uh, focused on Arctic observing. Um, and also in the last 10 years, there's been the development of an international initiative, Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks, or SEON, which we'll hear a little bit more about later on. Um, the it first Arctic Science Ministerial back in 2016 um, in that process, as well as an external review of SEON, also brought some, some new fresh urgencies to uh, the different systemic limitations that uh, integrated sustained Arctic observations face. Um, for example, uh, with the current Arctic, IARPIC, the Interagency Arctic Research, uh, Arctic Research Plan, um, U.S. agencies at least responded by forming the U.S. AON. Um, to advance different critical issues nationally and to generate greater support for SEON and other related efforts. Um, so US AON board is in the middle there. If you can have the next uh, click, Liz, please. Um, today, I'm gonna focus on, and, and the invited speakers will outline a cluster of different activities that fall within the remit of US AON, as well as demonstrate how the different activities fit together to help us bridge the science policy plan, uh, planning interface with support both from federal and non-federal partners. So um, the USA on board was formed back in 2017 um, and a number of highlights uh, have reflected their activities since then, including uh, visioning goals exercise, the development of terms of reference for the board, uh, contributions to uh, the say on roads process and their definitions, as well as implementing, uh, developing and implementing a communication strategy of which this seminar is a part of. Um, as well, through IARPIC, uh, the board is connected to other IARPIC agencies, um, as represented by the IARPIC principles noted here in the hexagon above the USA on board. And they're lift, listed here above, uh, at least spatially, because um, they are more directly linked to the policy and resource and planning issues. Um, next click, please, Liz. Um, through IARPA collaborations, some of which of you are familiar with, the different collaboration teams and sub-teams and self-forming teams, as well as through other partnerships, US Aon also reaches beyond just the federal family to, to really harness the, the talent and insights uh, of the greater community, including uh, local indigenous communities throughout, throughout the Arctic. So um, you can see here, this is our, our general framework. Um, with the next slide, uh, please, Liz, um, I wanna go ahead and introduce the current board members. Um, in addition to serving as uh, program director for the Arctic Observing Network at the National Science Foundation, I also currently chair the USA on board, 
alongside uh, my colleagues, Michelle McClure from, from NOAA and Thorsten Marcus from NASA. And they have, we have several other representatives on the board, uh, including David Allen from NOAA, Kathy Kuhn from Bohm, Larry Hinsman from the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Suzanne Van Drenick from the Environmental Protection Agency, Sally McFarland from the Department of Energy. Uh, and the primary support is provided uh, by Sandy Starkweather, the Executive Director, and by Hazel Shapiro, Program Analyst. Um, so that's enough for my opening remarks. Um, I want to move on to our invited speakers, and I'll start with uh, Sally McFarlane, uh, one of the current uh, USA on board members. She comes to us from the Department of Energy. She is program manager for the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement or ARM user facility. Uh, in addition to being a USA on board member, she also co chairs the IARPIC um, Arctic Observing Systems subteam. So I'll hand it over to Sally. Thank you, Roberto. So as Roberto mentioned, I am a member of the USA on board and I'm also a co-chair of the Arctic Observing Systems subteam. So I help serve as a bridge between those two hexagons on, on Roberto's chart. So as both Liz and Roberto mentioned, IARPIC has what are called collaboration teams. And so these are teams that are open to federal researchers, non-federal researchers, and other stakeholders interested in Arctic issues, including international participants, local participants, indigenous peoples. So um, our uh, team, uh, the co-chairs of our team are myself, Sandy Starkweather, who you're gonna hear from uh, in a moment, and Will Ambrose from Coastal Carolina University, who I believe is also on the call today. So our um, team in the current, so, um, the collaboration teams were all formed, um, were initially formed to support the, the IARPIC research plan. However, they have also kind of taken on some life of their own since then. And there's several um, self-forming teams where actually members of the community have decided that a collaboration team is needed around a particular area. But our particular team um, is, was focused in the current IARPIC research plan on supporting what is known as performance element 9.1. But this is about enhancing participation in activities to improve best practices, coordination, and synthesis of Arctic observations towards a fully integrated interagency US Arctic observing network. So you can see how this supports the goals of the USA on board that Roberto was mentioning earlier. Um, but what's unique about the collaboration team as opposed to the board is that it does bring in the non-federal researchers and stakeholders. So it's an opportunity for um, you to participate and to engage with the federal program managers that make up the USA on board. So next slide, please. So just to give you a flavor of what um, the type of topics that our collaboration team um, is interested in and has had meetings on, I've listed a couple of recent meetings as well as some upcoming meetings that we have. So um, back in January, we had a meeting on um, United Nations Decade of Ocean Science Planning. And this was a meeting that we held jointly with the physical oceanography team. And that is one of the self-forming teams I mentioned where a group of um, scientists felt that there needed to be more um, discussion around oceanography as part of IARPIC. And so they formed this team. And with that team, we, the observing team has, um, started a series on integrated observing of the Arctic Ocean. And so that was one of our, our first meetings on that topic. In March, we had a meeting on um, early career, uh, with early career researchers in observational science. So trying to understand both the challenges and opportunities that those early career researchers face, and particularly challenges that are associated with developing a career in observational science. Um, coming up in April, we are having a joint meeting with the IARPIC data team, and we're going to look at perspectives on international govern governance and data interoperability. Then in May, we're having another, um, another meeting with the physical oceanography team, and this one is really focusing on more of a science topic, whereas our January meeting was, was more of a policy-related topic. And then um, Sandy will talk more about this in, in her um, remarks, but in June, we're going to have one of our biannual meetings where we focus on more international observing topics and our relationship with SEON. And then finally, we are currently in the process of planning a couple of meetings for the summer with other teams, um, one on observing system simulation experiments, 
and one on updates on polar observing technologies. So if you have interest in either of those meetings, which are still really in the initial stages, or you have research that you'd like to, to present around those topics, please feel free to, to let me know. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Sandy. I have the next slide actually before Sandy starts. Yeah, so just briefly, thank you, Sally, for, for indicating and describing that link between the USAON uh, to IR for collaborations. Um, and I'll invite Sandy now um, to speak to the US community to SEON, um, which brings us back up closer to the policy interface. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Sandy, she is an affiliate with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as well as the executive director of US AON, and also serving currently as the chair of, of Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks Initiative, or SEON. Sandy. Thanks, Roberto, and welcome, everybody. Um, if I could get one more click. So I'm moving to uh, the next polygon in our organizational Venn diagram here. Um, and on the next slide, I'll give you a broader sense. Um, I think it's clear to anybody engaged in Arctic observing or data systems that the uh, level of activities on the international front is, um, is at least on par with the level of activities that we have nationally. And as Roberto mentioned in his opening remarks, one of the um, key uh, um, impetus, uh, one of the key rationale for forming, uh, creating the interagency US Aon was to improve our ability nationally to serve as a better hub um, to, uh, to both link uh, national interests into processes like SEON. I sometimes say SEON plus because there's other initiatives such as the UN Decade for Ocean Science, with which Sally also talked about, um, that have kind of overlapping remits. And so, um, so our role as the National Committee to SEON plus uh, is one of the ways that we draw people together into a twice annual conversation. We do this in collaboration with the with the data team, um, and up until now, those meetings have, the agenda on those meetings has been fairly informal and informational. But we would like to move to a more um, progressive agenda because there's so much going on right now. And so, because we meet through the IARPIC collaborations, this is like IARPIC collaborations, an inclusive interface where anybody can join in and participate. Um, and where we can hear from the key people who are carrying a lot of water back and forth between these activities, but also hear from all of you about what your engagements are um, and, and what's important um, in your work in the international space. So SEON um, is itself supported by, uh, by two committees. It's Committee on Networks, um, which is led by Lisa Lissetto. Um, and this committee uh, works towards gathering inventories of national activities and ideally will begin linking those inventories of national activities towards things like societal benefit frameworks to help us understand the extent to which our inventories are supporting the kinds of things that we think we need to do with an observing system and ultimately to help identify where the gaps may lie. The Arctic Data Committee, which has been led for a long time by Peter Pulsifer, um, is a shared committee with IASC. And this committee, um, I think they're, if they had a, a, a keyword, it would be interoperability. So they draw together the, the national data centers and link through the data committee with international data centers um, on issues related to the roll up your sleeves, how are we um, defining our vocabularies and how can we relate our vocabularies to each other but then all the way up, um, as Roberto indicated, to the policy level. So for example, they're working on a polar data policy right now. And, um, and our role as a national committee will be to review and comment on that policy and make sure it's really gonna serve our needs. And more recently, SAN has also added the scope related to its roadmap for Arctic observing and data systems, which really kind of ties those first two pieces together what are we seeing as the needs from the networks? What are we seeing as the needs from the data systems into more of a vision about where we're gonna go and what kind of strategies we're gonna employ to address um, some of the systemic issues that we're still facing in Arctic observing and data systems. 
I'll note that each of these committees uh, on networks and data has nationally appointed representatives, as does the SEON board. So Roberto Delgado, Kathy Kuhn are national representatives to the SEON board. And we're currently actually seeking national representation um, on our committees. We've had some turnover and uh, IARPIC and the National Academies is assisting us with that. I'll speak more about the roads process in a moment and how we see this committee as playing a critical role in the linking. But first I'd also like to note that in these meetings, um, we've also found it really useful to support the Arctic Observing Summit process, both the preparation of white papers, the identification of themes, um, helping people kind of coalesce around some of the key ideas, doing some recruitment and participation for the summit, but also acting on the recommendations from the summit. We had a really nice readout from the last summit um, and, uh, and, and the, previous, the readout from the previous summit in Davos actually led to the creation of one of the activities that you're gonna hear about later. Um, and so AOS clearly a key partner. Next slide. So SANS Roadmap for Arctic Observing and Data Systems is really in its formative phase. We're just beginning to define it in collaboration with the Arctic Observing Summit. But what we're really trying to do here is to develop a, 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 an understanding of how we can link the assets, opportunities, and needs, um, how we can identify where these have their strongest intersections from the standpoint of indigenous identified and indigenous led efforts, um, from the standpoint of regionally defined uh, science and decision-making things, things like the Arctic Council, but also like a lot of the constituents on ARPA collaborations uh, research community, and then how those also intersect with the activities of the global networks. And we call the, the kind of concept in the center of the roads process, shared Arctic variables. We have not identified any yet. Um, as I say, we're in a formative stage, but this is sort of the concept of partnership that we see come together to support the international process, but it's also going to require a lot of work nationally where we can identify who the key people are um, within the US who can come together uh, and help us build these, these shared strategies to improve what we're doing in the Arctic. So I will stop there and pass it on to our next speaker. Thanks. Thanks, Sandy, for adding that description of USAON's linkage to the international uh, and SEON efforts. Um, next, I'd like to invite Hazel Shapiro to uh, speak to, um, to, to uh, other USAON partnerships, uh, specifically task teams. Uh, so filling, uh, basically filling out our, our complete diagram here. Hazel? Thank you so much, Roberto. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today. Uh, it's really great to see so many people on the call. My name is Hazel Shapiro, and I'm the US Aon Program Analyst. Um, and Liz, if you could go to the next slide. So as you've heard, the goal of US Aon is to overall improve the integrated performance of Arctic-wide observing systems. Uh, so one piece, we, one way that we do this is uh, you could think of it as getting the right people in the room, um, which is building these partnerships through IARPIC and at the international level um, and contributing there. The other thing that we need to be able to do is we need to understand where we are right now in order to understand how we can improve. Um, and so in order to do this, we're employing a tool called value tree analysis to analyze where the observing system is delivering value and where it's falling short. Um, and this pathway links back to that U.S. contribution to the SEON roads process for those of you that are familiar um, at that level. The challenge really in this is the scope of the Arctic observing system. Obviously, it's very large um, and, and often changing. Um, and so how do we deliver this in a way where it's comprehensive enough to be useful to decision makers and where we can keep it up to date? And so um, the way that we're doing this is through USA on tasks. Um, and I think we still have, uh, there's a lot of improvements that we can make to this process, um, but uh, it's uh, moving forward really well and we're getting a, a good feedback on it. And so um, the solution is that we're picking pieces, specific pieces of the observing system. For example, key products that underlie the Arctic report card. And I'll talk about that example in a little while um, or 
taking a specific service, for example, daily sea ice forecasting and looking at all of the observing systems that feed up into that um, service. And then we work with an array of subject matter experts to really understand um, where the observing systems and data products are delivering value um, and where there's gaps and opportunities for improvement. Um, so on the next slide, I have an example of a value tree analysis that we completed in partnership with the Arctic Report Card. This annual publication from NOAA highlights key indicators of environmental change, um, and it's been an annual publication for the last 15 years. And so we were able to look over that uh, span over the last 15 years and see um, really uh, in a discrete way the way that the observing system has changed over time um, and understand right now where it is today, where it's delivering value and information well, um, and where there are opportunities. And so you can see in this diagram, I'll, I'll try to um, walk you through it a little bit. On the left side, you'll see observing systems. Those feed up into data products in the middle, um, and then through the vital signs of the Arctic report card, which is uh, specific SA titles, you could think of that, or, or specific variables. And then in this diagram, we're representing only one societal benefit area, fundamental understanding of Arctic systems. That's really just for simplicity. We, when we do the analysis, we look at a broader array of Arctic specific societal benefit areas, um, some of which are more or less relevant depending on what we're looking at. So examples of some other Arctic societal benefit areas include food security or disaster preparedness. Um, so when you're reading through this graphic, the thickness of the line indicates the relative contribution of each observing system or data product, depending on, so if you're looking at the left, like a, about a third of the way down, you'll see in situ glacier gates, SAR and bed machine all feed up into promise solid ice discharge. The SAR is slightly less relied upon. You'll see that because the thickness of the line is a little bit less. Um, and the bed machine, is performing well, it's uh, rated as good, which means it meets all the major requirements with um, a few limitations. And then the glacier gates and SAR, um, which stands for synthetic aperture radar, uh, those are fully satisfying their requirements. Um, and you can see that in the key there. You'll note also that in the essay, uh, we do have a glossary. So if you're not sure what some of these acronyms are, uh, that can be a helpful reference. Um, yes, and so this, this is reflects only the 2020 report card and we also have some information in the essay about how the observing system has changed over time. And I will drop a link in the chat to that essay and I'd encourage you to take a deeper look um, at and you can understand a bit more of the process and, and how we used uh, subject matter experts to uh, to, to get this information. And, and some of our subject matter experts, I believe, are actually on this call. So I'd say thank you to those authors of the Arctic Report Card that contributed to this work. Um, so the task teams here that we're talking about are very specific, but I did want to mention that US Aon works with a much broader array of partnerships. And we've developed a brief write-up describing some of the other types of partnerships that we're targeting. Um, one of the, one Interesting example is that USAON is working with Coeric, uh, and we're partnering with them next week to develop a training, or, or they are leading the training and, and we're sponsoring it uh, to give Western observational scientists a better understanding of Arctic indigenous history and co-production methodologies. And after this webinar, Sandy is going to upload a broader impacts document to the Arabic Collaborations website, which will lay out other opportunities uh, for partnership with USAON. So please take a, keep an eye out for that um, and reach out if you're interested or you have another task you'd like to suggest. With that, I will pass it back to Roberto. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hazel. Appreciate those remarks. Um, and I've neglected to, uh, to introduce you properly, aside from being the program analyst for USAON, you also serve double duty as part of the IARPIC Secretariat, so helping to facilitate coordination uh, with the collaboration teams and, and sub teams, including the Arctic Observing Systems, the data and the modeling teams. Um, so thank you for that. Um, next, I'd like to invite Matt Jones. Um, who is Principal Investigator of the National Science Foundation funded Arctic Data Center, also Director of Informatics Research and Development, the National Center for Ecological Analyses and Synthesis, uh, housed at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Matt. Thank you, Roberto. 
So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking a little bit more about the uh, Aon partnerships and the way in which we've had a collaboration between the Arctic Data Center and uh, Sandy and, and Hazel at, uh, at Aon and other repositories around the world that have been involved in the Arctic Report Card. So the, the Aon Arctic Report Card, as, as Hazel indicated, is based on data from international studies and synthesizes information very broadly to understand trends in the Arctic using the value tree analysis framework that was just presented. Um, the Arctic Data Center collaborated with Aon Partners to create a data portal um, that explicitly links the vital sign essays and the key variables that Sandy mentioned and other critical metadata to the data sets that were used to reach the conclusions in the report card. Um, so it, the portal itself, it provides background on the report card, um, on the effort and how to access the data. It gives a little bit of, of background on value tree analysis, but then links back to the original, the report card site at NOAA um, for, for more information. Um, we think this is really important because it provides uh, critical information about the, the data that's, that underlies the, the analyses within the report card and provides a level of traceability and transparency that's not possible when you don't have access to, to those data. Um, this work was inspired by other similar efforts. We've, we have followed the work of the US National Climate Assessment for many years and they're really excellent uh, the excellent job that they do in documenting the sort of conclusions that people make in the climate assessment all the way back to the original models and data that drive those conclusions. And so those kinds of efforts that uh, improve the provenance and traceability of scientific findings, we think are, are really um, valuable um, because it allows us to understand the basis for decisions that are critical to society. And we wanted this, this data portal within the Arctic report card to start down that path, even though it was really just an initial effort with the 2020 data. Um, I wanted to point out that this, you know, although we coordinated this effort at the Arctic Data Center with the folks from Aon, this is really um, an international effort. Um, the data for the report card are distributed currently across 16 international data repositories, although we weren't able to um, link to every data set that was used in the report card. The, the, the ones that we were able to find for this year um, uh, span 16 repositories. Um, many of the federal agencies, including NSF, NSIDC, NASA, and NOAA, and others were involved, but also uh, many international groups. Um, Pangea had a lot of data sets, the European Geosciences, Promise, um, and others. And so the, all of these different repositories have their own systems for archiving data and for preserving it and making it accessible. And um, we really need to come up with mechanisms for this to be, for these repositories to contribute to efforts like the US, uh, sorry, like the Aon uh, report card, the Arctic report card um, as part of an interoperable system. So one of the efforts that we did, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to tell you to advance the slide there, Liz, for that one. So these are the logos from those, those agencies that we, uh, we were talking about. Um, and could you go ahead and advance the slide again? So one of the, the efforts that we undertook during this process of trying to document the data sets that were affiliated with Arctic report card variables um, was to cross link the vital signs and key variables that are used within the report card to the data sets that are specifically um, used in those, those particular parts of the report card. And so we created formal vocabularies um, that have all of the terms, subject terms, uh, vital signs, essays, and variables that were used in the report card, and then and used a formal annotation process to link the data sets that are associated with each, making it possible for people to you know, find the data sets that are associated with each report card and to, to, to locate those and then to find other data sets that are also about that, that particular subject. This kind of formal linking or, 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 or using semantics and provenance to trace the sort of origin of data sets to the particular scientific findings, I think is a really important thing for uh, repositories internationally to focus on. Um, so next year, we, we hope to engage with um, other repositories that provide this type of information so that we can rather than sort of collating it after the fact, we can directly access that information in machine readable formats, uh, and trace the results back to those, those archives and increase the coverage for the report card findings. So collaborations between Aon, 
the Arctic Data Center and these other Arctic repositories will really be key to these types of interoperability and open data initiatives. Um, we think the AON and the Arctic Data Committee of IAS and SION and other partners that are working towards interoperable, interoperable data systems will really help us to streamline these types of efforts. And so this is just an example of one of the types of, of partnerships that we think will be made easier through the types of efforts that the Arctic Data Committee is undertaking. So with that, I'll turn over to the next speaker. Thanks, Matt, uh, for that, that overview. Um, we have, yes, one final invited speaker. Um, I'd like to invite Hayo Aiken, who is Professor of Geophysics at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and uh, Director of the International Arctic Research Center. Tell us a little about uh, research network, networking activity on which he is a principal investigator, in which aligns with the uh, scope and goals of USAON. Hayo. Yes, thanks, uh, Roberto. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm, I'm talking to you from the uh, Trasyada campus on the uh, uh, traditional homelands of the Lower Tanana Dene um, here in Fairbanks at the University of, Fairbanks, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I just wanted to share with you a brief perspective that tries to lay out how some of the different hexagons or elements of this um, uh, intersectional schematic that you've seen um, relate to other efforts that are meant to support some of these activities that you've heard of, in particular uh, through the Arctic Observing Summit, uh, SEON's roadmap for Arctic observing uh, and data systems, or SEON roads. The project um, that I'm part of is, um, uh, is still in its early stages. Um, we, we, we've been in a longer ramping up phase. Um, you see some of the key participants called out here. I'll be referencing a few other people here as well. And you also see some of our supporters, uh, specifically National Science Foundation. The next slide is a um, kind of a, a, a recasting of some of the information that's been presented earlier by Hazel and Sandy. And it talks a bit more about one of the goals that we are hoping to support through this um, Arctic Co-ops project or RNA Arctic Co-ops. And that is to facilitate bottom-up um, organization and coordination of sustained observing efforts across a range of different types of activities that you see represented here, just a few examples on the left. Um, the challenge in the Arctic in particular is how do you bring these different observing activities, which span a range of scales, a range of different disciplines into a framework that then allows a, a, a range of different groups of data users, information users to reap benefits, these societal benefits um, and value tree frameworks that you've seen referenced. Um, and the say on roads process is meant to facilitate that um, with the idea of ending up um, ideally with shared uh, or essential variable frameworks. So you see that illustrated just in one example here through the Circumpolar uh, Biodiversity Monitoring Program. But the, uh, the, the last Arctic Observing Summit uh, that took place um, uh, just, a, uh, just over a year ago really helped cement this concept of shared Arctic variables that in particular Alice Bradley, who's part of our team, who's also on this call here, has been leading. Um, and so that's one of the concepts that we're trying to uh, advance. The next slide gives you a brief perspective of what the approach of the RNA uh, co-ops project is. Um, it's, it's, it's a bottom-up approach that draws heavily on meetings and, and other forms of collaborations close partnership with the Arctic Observing Summit Food Security Working Group. And I want to recognize uh, at least a couple of members that I've seen here um, who've been uh, active in the Arctic uh, Observing Summit Food Security Working Group, specifically Rachel Daniel and Margaret Rudolph who are on this um, call. Um, so, so the idea being that through these bottom-up processes, um, there will um, come about um, uh, the, the emergence of, of a framework of requirements, what types of observations need to be um, made how in order to meet the requirements of the, the information users. And that is, is a key step, of course, towards design development of, of such observing systems and ultimately creation of information infrastructure, similar to what you'd seen Matt Jones illustrate in, in the previous presentation. The, the next and final slide is, is meant to give you a, a bit of a glimpse as to how this um, then relates to some of what you've heard um, in, in the previous 
presenters' contributions. So you see here the same type of structure that was introduced earlier by Roberto. Um, and you see some, not all of the collaborators or members of this collaboration called out here in, in the different sectors. And, and rather than go into the details, um, I'd just like to highlight a few of, the, of both the opportunities and the progress that, that emerges from this diagram, but also some of the challenges that we need to collaborate on and that ultimately the, uh, our RNA Arctic Co-ops project is meant to help address. If you, look at, if you look at the structure, you see that there's good representation um, in the framework of our project with various um, of the US entities here. Um, and you also see already called out some of our key international partners, uh, in particular, um, National Institute of Polar Research in Japan, Alfred Wigner Institute in Germany. But um, in particular, the, the linkage between US Aeon activities into the international realm is something that we're hoping to advance further. And that is uh, uh, specifically with, with some of the challenges we've seen with COVID-19 uh, been made more difficult, but we, we have evolved a series of, of uh, approaches to, to help us move forward on that end. The other, other point I want to highlight is um, and, and this is an important one, is to recognize that the structure of this diagram in terms of policy, resource and planning issues, science and technology issues, as well as the structures that have emerged around IARPIC in over the past decade or so, were, weren't designed with indigenous peoples or the peoples of the Arctic in mind. And so one of the areas that we hope to make progress on, but um, that at the same time is, is not an insignificant challenge, is how to engage in this type of work while drawing on principles of knowledge co-production, at the same time recognizing that the current structures may not put um, our indigenous collaborators and community scholars and experts in the best position to be able to collaborate with us. Um, I, I'm grateful for uh, the members of the Food Security Working Group having had the patience to, to um, continue to work through this process with us. I, I also appreciate the patience of our other team members who uh, come to this with very specific focused goals. Just want to recognize the uh, um, uh, design development team that's led by Hank Losher and Melissa Genazio. And so the, the question that we might want to spend a bit more time on in, in the discussion period today as well is, is how can we make sure that these types of structures that were designed with the realities of the US interagency <clears throat> uh, Arctic interest landscape in mind can be, can be open enough <clears throat> and, and are malleable enough uh, for us to jointly transform them, transform them as we work on some of these pressing issues together. Thanks. Thank you so much, Haya. I really like this, this slide that indicates the, the broad range of participation opportunities across different stakeholders. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all of our, our speakers for their remarks. Um, just this last slide before we get into our discussion and, and question and answer session. Um, for those of you who would like additional information and are, and are not already connected through, to one of, or more of the board members or other collaboration teams, um, Sandy, Hazel, and myself are primary uh, points of contact. Uh, our emails are on this slide. Um, and you can always follow up with us uh, to, again, learn more information, ask questions, and explore additional ways for, for partnering and contributing to, to different USA on activities and goals. So um, with that, I think we can um, take away the slides and get our gallery view and try to track uh, questions. Um, from folks. Uh, I know there have been a few things in the chat already, um, but if folks want to raise their hands, um, or I don't know if uh, you only have, if there are phone only participants, perhaps we can uh, open the, the floor to them initially. Um, and uh, I'll rely on maybe Liz and Hazel to, to help you track any of those additional questions. Um, I know that. Oh, go ahead, Liz. Go ahead, Hazel. I was just going to uh, take a first pass at Kelly's question, which I saw in the chat. Um, so maybe I'll just read it. Does the value tree assessment also take into consideration threats such as funding horizons? Um, and I would say, yes, we do try to capture that information when we're um, 
developing the value tree analysis, one difficulty is in the sort of synthesis and communication and creating those diagrams, um, balancing how do we convey the like huge depth um, of subject matter expertise, understanding of where those observing and data products are versus like making it readable to an, to an audience. Um, and so that's definitely a challenge. And one thing I forgot to mention is that we are working on developing an interactive tool to visualize the value tree analysis where you'd be able to click on a specific node and see more information um, or, or uh, filter a view based on your specific interest. And I think that tool, once it's up and running, will give us a lot more flexibility to convey that kind of information. Um, Sandy, do you have anything else to add there? Shake. So thank you, Hazel, for that. Um, I see Jack Dibbs' hand is raised, um, and he also put in some, some comments in the chat. So Jack. Yeah, I mean, I put a question in the chat directed to Matt, and he kind of answered it, and I'm not sure we're talking about exactly the same thing. Um, I understand that we can talk about harmonizing, like, you know, definitions and names and things like that, but what I was asking is, when I was reading through the report card, and actually I was reviewing several of the chapters, um, but it struck me that, you know, there, let's say there's a chapter in the report card on surface air temperature trends. And that's like the authoritative statement about surface air temperature, or, or maybe it's sea ice extent, or maybe it's like river flow. But then there's another chapter later on that's about greening. And they talk about how they're trying to find correlations about surface spatial patterns and surface air temperature. And they use entirely different uh, compilations and data sets for surface air temperature in the two different uh, chapters. And it seemed a little odd if one is, you know, like this is our best guess as what we think surface air temperature is doing within the one report card. There were different versions of a data set that ostensibly seemed to be the same thing. And I'm wondering if anybody's looking to see if they really are the same or how big the differences are, or is there an effort at, in USAON or SAON to, to create harmonized merge, you know, addressing the fact that there are products by these different groups. Like, I mean, think about meteorology, ECMWF and GMAO and NSEP, they probably all have differences. And is anybody trying to adjudicate these differences and work towards a best product or a recommended best product. Thanks so that was question. my Thanks for your question, Jack. I think Sandy uh, has something to speak to that and, and perhaps Matt as well can follow up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I don't wanna speak too extensively on behalf of the Arctic Report Card because the Arctic Report Card is a, a longstanding entity that we partnered with. Um, and so the practices and um, choices that are made by the individual author teams um, on the Arctic Report Card, they have a lot of autonomy in um, which data products they use and, and how they use them and why. And this question actually came up a lot because as you said, you know, groups wanna see things like sea ice concentration um, for different reasons inside their essays, but they might use very different data products from one another. And, but what I can speak to from the standpoint of the analysis that we did is that this is the first time the report card um, authors really in a succinct visual, visual summary saw what each other was using and how each other thought those data products were performing. And so the same product, which might perform really well for um, you know, a tundra greening analysis because it meshes up with the uh, satellite footprint or the extensiveness of the data or even the length of the data record might not be the same data product that somebody is going to be using to interpret changes to ocean primary productivity. And so we're really hopeful that the kinds of analyses that we're doing here are going to help support those kinds of conversations and maybe, you know, most critically, it's like if, if people are saying, hey, these data products really stink and they're not meeting anybody's needs, then that says, let's come in together and focus on this and, and, and make the improvements needed, which is a greater problem than maybe having some duplication in the kinds of data products that people are using if they're happy with them. Thanks, Andy. Yep. Yeah, and I was just going to speak more generally to this question of data integration for particular analytical purposes. So 
the Arctic report card is one example of that, but there are many examples where researchers try to reuse data for particular analytical and modeling purposes, and they make very specific and I think reason, reasonable or re well-reasoned choices about how they do that integration that, that play the trade-offs of their particular analysis against the, the strengths and weaknesses of the data sources they have available. And so even within you know, the same team, you might make different decisions about how, how to harmonize uh, data sets and integrate them when you're say moving across spatial scales trying to focus on one particular resolution, like the greening problem you, I don't know the specifics of this one, but the greening problem you raised might have, you know, a very different, you know, set of goals with respect to spatial resolution than another problem. And so they might want to bring different data sets to bear uh, to that or to process them in different ways. And so this, what I said earlier about, there is no, in the chat about, there's no one size fits all integrated data product that meets all analytical and modeling needs. I think, I believe very firmly that the, the various data products that are available can be combined in, in, in a wide variety of, of reasonable ways to be used and target specific analyses and that we shouldn't be thinking that there's going to be sort of a single one way that everybody does it to maximize the scientific value of the data. That said, like I classify the, the heterogeneity of data into kind of two big sort of mental buckets. Um, so there's he heterogeneity that's intentful, meaning somebody chose to do something differently because there's a scientific value to doing it that way. And then there's kind of what I think of as arbitrary heterogeneity, which arises because people are either unaware or don't have the resources to track all of the standards and processes that everybody else has and can't come together with sufficient time and resources to, to build the right products. And that's where these integrated networks can help eliminate some of that arbitrary heterogeneity that is there just because you know, there needs to be better communication and, and sharing of information across projects. But the, the intentful heterogeneity, I think, can and should remain in the process. Yeah, I just want to make it clear that I, I just made up those examples. I don't remember what, there, there were several in chapters, you know, I actually reviewed all the chapters. I shouldn't have said that, but um, they didn't ask me to, they asked me to do one, but they said, if you want to look at any others, so I read them all and I, I just noticed this. And the examples I gave were completely made up. I don't, I don't think there's anything specific about greening or river flow. But, you know, even something, I guess the kind of question I ask is you look at NOAA and NASA and probably ECMWS all are kind of tabulating global atmospheric and mean annual temperature, right? And ranking them. And they all come up with slightly different answers, but they're very, very close. But I, I could imagine on the scale of the Arctic with, you know, the poor observing or whatever, you could get regional or Arctic wide summaries that differ by a lot. And is anybody trying to look at that and decide if any of them are missing something or the way off? I, I don't know that there are cases. I'm just wondering if there's a group that's trying to look at that. This Thanks, Jack. Alice? Broader, no, go ahead. Uh, this, this broader question that you, you've brought up um, of kind of how and where do these data sets and the people who are using them talk to each other is exactly the problem that the shared Arctic variable approach is trying to address. Um, we've got so many different user communities. We've got so many different um, data producers, each that have different information needs. And so the idea here is to structure a um, effectively a community of practice that built, brings in these different user groups, these different um, observer groups to uh, actually kind of force everyone to sit down at the table and talk about what they need, what they don't need, and why there might be uses for these different types of products. Um, so whether or not it's all intentional right now, the hope is that in the long run, it becomes intentional um, through, through structuring these conversations around this shared Arctic variable model. Thank you, Alice, for adding that. All right. Have any other questions at the moment? So I, just while we're waiting, if somebody thinks about it, I'd like to respond to Alice and just say, I think that's great. The shared Arctic variables approach is, um, is really valuable. And there are other efforts to create sort of standardized, both just typing variables in a way that people can understand whether two things are the same or different is helpful. And there's there are groups both 
within the Arctic Data Center, but also within the, uh, the polar data community trying to create shared ontologies for expressing the contents of data sets and their relationship to variables and, and measurement types. And so I think it would be helpful to connect the shared Arctic variables effort to the Arctic Data Committee and the, and the Cyan and IASC efforts to create vocabularies around that, because I think those are related. Thanks, Matt. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, and take into account the limited time we have just under five minutes. Um, I think I may ask, oh wait, I think there's, there's a comment from Javier Fotosata. Javier, would you like to come off mute and? Um... Yeah, no, I was just following Jack's comment actually. I'm using that example that significantly, you know, the boreal forest actually, uh, the surface temperature on the story is completely different from the, because of the continuous permafrost from the canopy top. And one instrument and space measure the canopy top temperature while in situ ground-based instruments measure the other kinds of temperature under story. Uh, so uh, I will say that, uh, you know, a, a, a detailed description of the variables is needed so that users and modelers, whenever they apply and use the data, they know what, what it is, you know? So that, that's, I, I think that uh, probably that adds on Jack's uh, question actually. Thanks, Javier. And I see that Patrick Heimbach has uh, added a, another response to Jack's question. Um, but with just our last few minutes here, I'd like to perhaps invite uh, each of our speakers um, to maybe come up with one take home message um, as a takeaway for our audience, for our participants, uh, that they would like uh, for folks to, to think about and consider from what we presented today. Um, so I know it's putting everyone on the spot, but just you know, what, what is the most important message that everyone should take away from, from the USA on in our activities? Um, so I'll just start with, you know, go down the list of, of our speakers and begin with Sally. Hey, Roberto, I guess the thing that I would like people to take away most is that the Arctic Observing Systems Collaboration Team is a collaboration team. So we welcome collaborations with the community. We encourage you to, to get involved, join our meetings. If you have any ideas for topics or, or research you want to present on the topics that I mentioned, please feel free to, to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Um, next, Sandy. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll make a, my comment as a partial response to the challenge that Hayo outlined about how we um, do a better job with Indigenous engagement in activities like USA on and say on and, and IARPIC in general. And, you know, today we had a discussion, a three hour long mini workshop um, at the say on level of, about national committee work. And one of the things that came up was that say on often is more interacting at the level of, of the permanent participant organization. So these are, you know, big kind of global agents, um, kind of UN level global agents um, that represent a, a large number of indigenous peoples, but are often a little bit disconnected from precisely what the community is talking about. In other dialogues, we've heard that the governance structures within indigenous communities, it's, it's very complex and we need to embrace that complexity. And so I think our national committee to say on is one place where we can have those, um, those kinds of engagements and relationship building across all those different scales. So we're not always just focused on the permanent participants. Thanks, Sandy, appreciate that. Um, Hazel, that's uh, one take home message for folks. Um, I think my one take home message would be that the uh, Arctic systems are very complex and Arctic observing the the network of Arctic observations is really complex and the USAON is trying to bring some coherence to that and in fact um, the people on this call are uh, a bit less complex and very accessible and so please feel free to reach out if there's a way that we can do a better job of of creating that coherence um, we're only an email away thanks Hazel um, Matt what's your takeaway I think my takeaway is that interoperability is is hard and necessary for all of the goals for AON to be resolved and that I really encourage groups to work both within agencies but really across agencies and across international boundaries to, to help solve some of these interoperability problems that um that I think are at at least a, a enabling 
issue that needs to be addressed in order for, for Aon and Cyan in general to make progress. Thanks, Matt. And we've just hit four o'clock. So Haya, your, your one parting word. Um, the Arctic research community is, is the most collaborative that I'm aware of. That's our biggest strength. And I, I feel that we can overcome all of these challenges or, or identifying the structures that may make some of this a bit more difficult. That's all something that we can address. And, and it's great to see that both at the agency level across the research community and outside of those, those areas, people are willing to put in time. So that's something we should, we should be happy about. Thanks. Thanks, Haya. Thanks, everyone. Um, appreciate everyone's time and uh, attention to today. And I hope that we hear from many of you soon. Uh, unless, Liz, there's anything to close out from the ARPIC end, I know that the recording will be available shortly. And uh, again, yes, thank you, everyone. Yep, just echoing Roberto's thanks and uh, to our audience and also to our speakers. We appreciate all of you taking the time to speak and to listen in. Um, the recording will be up on the event page and also on our YouTube, which I'm dropping a link in the chat real quick. Uh, you can find all of our meetings recorded there. And we hope to see you at future collaboration team meetings and webinars. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Liz.